what's going on everybody welcome back to the submission fishing live podcast glad you could join us new time same day bringing you the world's best fishing entertainment we've got a good show for you guys today we're going to talk about some uh, there's actually a really important case in the uh, actually up in the federal level going to the supreme court that involves them some fishermen that Billy's got some pretty deep implications. So we're going to go into that a little bit about some herring fishermen. And it's actually kind of a bigger deal than I thought once when I was looking into it, but it could be some big changes on the horizon, depending how it goes. So we'll definitely go over that, see what it means for us. Uh, if it passes, if it goes through, but, um, yeah, pretty interesting. What's going down there. Uh, should be really good. Cape dog. What's going on, Cal? Oos, good to see you. Sammy Prum. What's going on, man? Oos. Chief Pedro. What's up, man? Not much, just chilling. David, Guzzi, what's up? Oos, Graham, Steve Mendoza, what's going on, dude? I saw your charter going on again. Check that out if you still got spots open. Richie Rich, what's going on, man? Glad you could join us. Mel, what's going on, man? If you guys want to join us, Oliver, Mel, I'm um, pretty much doing the live on YouTube. I'll stream it here for a little bit, but I'm probably going to hop on to um, switch it over to the YouTube channel in a little bit. So just kind of letting some people get in. I'll really get the ball rolling. So you guys have been fishing or what? Or been too cold? Give me the scoop. What's the California life like? Out here it's been pretty cold. Kiwi reacts. What's up, man? Good to see you again. What's going on, guys? Instagrammers. How's the East Coast been treating you guys? It's been good. Um, it's been different, you know. Um, Weather-wise, it's been like it was near freezing today. You know, everybody talks about how like warm it is in florida and stuff like that but we're kind of where i moved was northeast florida up in jacksonville so it gets pretty cold it was um did it hit freezing today maybe it was in the 30s for sure um we still went fishing though it got up to like 60 but it's, it's definitely been a cold snap it's been wet too and i know i've heard like people say it rains a lot in florida and stuff like that and i thought that was normal but apparently it's not for locals i've been talking to say it's um it's actually pretty rare for like this much rain in the winter. Apparently rain is like a big time, uh, like summer thing. So the winters, I guess are not as heavy as they have been. It's, it's been pretty bad. Tons of water. What's going on guys? Bates. What's up, man? Howie, what's going on, dude? Fishing with moot. What's up, dude? We're on, um, I'm doing the live show on YouTube. If you guys want to hop on, I'll probably be signing up here. It's waiting for some people to roll in and, We'll get the get the show going. Too cold for me with the cold front. Yeah. Kiwi, because you're in Texas, right? Yeah, man, it's it's been pretty damn cold. Has it been cold in California? Cold. Yeah. Spotty lockjaw. David. Yeah. That's crazy. I know we talked about that last time <laughs> or a couple of shows ago. You know, what's the um once the water cools down and they're cold blooded, the whole thing, the metabolic rate slows down. It's just, it's, it's painful for fishing. It's pretty crazy. Oliver SD fishing. What's going on, man? Graham says, love the chat. Just like the olden days. Yeah. So I think, you know, we might, I might just go back to the um, live show like we're doing now. I know it's earlier for you guys. We used to do it at 7 PM Pacific and I wasn't quite sure, you know, how many people would get to show up on um, the live when it's like 5 p.m you know on the pacific time but uh, we did it last week with kevin and so we're, we're gonna try it try to bring it back but i know it's it's harder time for to get people out i know a lot of people aren't even home from work and stuff like that but yeah definitely can't beat the chat and seeing all you guys good stuff sammy prom what's going on man 55 degree waters yeah that's pretty bad yeah kiwi's in south texas what's going on everybody instagram Let's some more people funnel in here. Had to fish with my jacket the last few weeks. Yeah. I mean, in California, it's, I fished with my jacket, like probably two thirds of the year out there though. It was, they seem like last, I don't think we had like a really last summer, I, last year, 2023 summer, I don't think was very bad in California, at least not coastal. Um, it was pretty mild. Like, I don't think it hit 80 degrees where we were out there. 
Lalo Fish, what's going on, man? Oos, welcome to the show. Glad you could join us. Yeah, go ahead and get this party started. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Submission Fishing Podcast. Glad you could join us. we got a pretty good show for you guys today. I'm going to talk about um, obviously, we'll answer some of your Instagram questions that I got from you guys at the end of the show. We'll do um, our main topic. I just want to kind of talk about this case that's coming up at the Supreme Court, which involves um, at the head of it is fishing, uh, fishery that's kind of stewing the government and um, what that can mean for everybody. It could be big changes uh, if it goes through. And um, yeah, talk about fishing, a little bit of news, all that good stuff. So hopefully you guys enjoy. If you have any questions, comments, questions, Obviously, let me know in the chat, and I'll answer them the best I can. If I have the answers, I don't know everything, but I'll try to do it. Let's see. Mild summer, yeah. I know we were talking in the chat earlier about what the temperature was like. It was pretty cold. So we went out to uh, went out fishing today. Went out with Kevin, and yesterday was like low 30s. Today was about 30 degrees too. But we waited. A, we went out probably around 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. Um, we went to go do some surf fishing and it was probably in the fifties or sixties when we went, but then the water just like, it really cooled down and we went over to Jacksonville beach. It wasn't so bad because I brought my waders. So I was like warm. I had my boots on my waders. Like I was in the surf, no big deal. Couldn't even feel the water. Kevin, straight bad man out there. He's wearing like, this dude's got like a hoodie on and shorts, no shoes. Now he was trying to avoid the water, but yeah, it wasn't working too well. Um, but we weren't really getting, but we only surfed the fish the surf, like not, not too long. We just backed out and then we went over to a pier. We went to Jacksonville Pier, cost a few bucks to get on. It was closed for like a couple of years because uh, it got damaged to some hurricanes, but they opened it up and uh, we went and hit the piers and I mean, we were crushing just blue fish left and right. It's not really what we were looking for. They're just kind of bait fish out here. They're almost like mackerel, um, just kind of a nuisance, but we were dropping the 10 gram uh, sumos and 10 gram assassin and it was literally like every cast. We probably caught 50 fish in the hour we were there, but yeah, it just got too cold. I mean, Kevin straight up dressed like it's summer out and it was freezing. And this couple came up to us and they're like, this lady was like, aren't you cold? And he was like, yeah, I'm freezing, but I'm fishing. <laughs> but we got to stay out here. It was nuts. But yeah, it eventually just got too unbearable, man. We had to go in, but we definitely got bit. We were thinking about going offshore. Uh, like we went offshore last week, but I'm pretty, I'm glad we did it. Even though we smashed it offshore, it just the uh, the weather wasn't going to cooperate, man. It wasn't looking good. What's going on, guys? On Instagram, we're on YouTube. If you want to join us, QB reacts says bluefish are fun. To be honest, yeah, I mean it was fun. It was just fun getting bit. You know, like it was one of those things we were talking like, oh, if you had kids or if you just brought like some kids out here and tossed down these little jigs and just got bit, it'd be a lot of fun. And it, it was fun, even though it was just like. Virtually no fight, even though we were using like super light spinning gear. It was it was still fun because we were just laughing like, every time. Like we we're counting down how quickly we'd get bit and how quickly we can pull them up and stuff. So it was it was still good. Definitely beats a skunk, that's for damn sure. Slaughterhouse fishing, what's going on, man? Not much, just doing the YouTube live. But yeah, those bluefish were all over the place. Apparently, they have big tournaments there. Um, they do like the kingfish and barracuda and all kinds of stuff. So. That's pretty crazy. Look forward to seeing what they have there with the peers later in the year. Let's see here. News wise, we just have, I uh, just want to touch on Spotty Bowl. For you guys that don't know, uh, Submission Fishing, uh, we sponsor Spotty Bowl. We've been like one of the longest sponsors there. And we're doing it this year. And we've kind of gone a lot bigger this year as far as what we're offering. Last year, we kind of would do like a prize pack uh, for the winner. So the first, or the person with the longest fish uh, on a submission jig got uh, it was like a hundred dollar gift card or something like that. But now we're doing um, every round for both LA and San Diego. Uh, whoever catches the longest fish on the submission jig, so you just make sure the jig's in your picture or in the fish's mouth when you measure it with your code. Um, you win twenty five dollar gift card. But this is reoccurring, so it's basically every every tournament. Every time they have one of the tournaments, uh, you guys can win this. So. A lot more opportunities to win and just remember guys that's out there so definitely go do it i think sammy won the last one so i gotta talk to judge and see how he wants to do that if he wants to divvy up i don't know if he's gonna want to divvy out the earnings 
at the end of the year, you know, all in one thing with like a bunch of gift cards or if he wants me to do it like as we go. So we'll definitely check it out. Travis, what's going on, man? Let's book a trip in spring. We slayed it. Yeah. Yeah, I've been on a few trips with you. We've done pretty well for sure. I have to check it out. I mean, California's not as accessible to me as it was, but we'll be down there again, definitely. David, yeah, it's every, every session. So uh, every session you have a chance for a $25 gift card on longest submission. So definitely upload them, you know, especially just a, a pro tip for Spotty Bowl. A lot of um, a lot of people neglect the side pots, you know, and they, and I know because you're just focused on fishing, but a lot of them, like, they're not just during the spotty hours. You can go like before and after um, and fish them. A lot of them even outside of the hours of spotty bowl, or you can fish maybe your day that you claimed is Saturday, but a lot of times you can still fish the pots and stuff like that on like Saturday or Friday, whenever the tournament is going. So definitely don't sleep on those guys. Check them out. It's a good way to get earnings. You'll see. I've been seeing a lot of guys winning a lot of the side pots because I think they've learned how to like game the system. You know, they, they figured it out. They're like, Oh, a lot of people aren't going for these side pots, but there's a lot of money, a lot of prizes. It's not just me. Lots of other sponsors are doing these things. So it's a good way to um, get in there and they're a little easier to win, you know, than winning a first place, you know, in the spotty bowl for sure. So definitely check that out. And, um, don't forget about those, especially if you're like not doing well and you don't think you're going to make playoffs. Just use your time and go for the side pots, man. At least get some winnings for sure. I said, are you and Kevin dialing in the golden tile fish out there? Um, we haven't yet. Steven, those, they're a little too deep. So we're, we're on the Atlantic side and and I guess the Gulf is sort of similar, but in order to get the tile fish, you have to go. We do plan on doing it, but it's really far to run. The weather's been too bad, a little too choppy, too windy. Because in order for us to get out to the shelf, I mean, I think we've got to make like a 50 or 60 mile run. So it's pretty far. Um, it's definitely going to have to be something in the summer where uh, we can take some extra gas on the boat and then use the use the daylight too. Days are kind of too short right now. It's going to be an adventure. We definitely plan to go get them, but the shelf is, it's pretty far out here. I know when you go like South Florida and stuff like that, what we're talking about the shelf is that it's out here in the Atlantic. It's very flat. I mean, I'm talking, we went out 20, 30, like 40 miles or something like that. I think we went out like 30 miles last time, 34 miles. And the deepest we saw was like a hundred feet. So it stays like 50, 60, hundred feet. Um, and then in order to hit the shelf where it actually drops down, it's like 600, thousand feet, 1200 feet. I think that's generally where the tile fish are, but we just haven't had, haven't had a chance to get out to that shelf yet where it drops off. And that's a little different. Um, as far as like California, you guys know, like you, most of my guys here are California guys. Like the depth is just at, it's astronomically deep. Like you go out 10 miles in California and you're like, legit can be in like 6,000 feet of water, 4,000 feet, 2,000 feet. So it's just a lot different. Um, so we have not had the tile fish yet, but we're going to dial them in. We've been crushing everything else, dude. We've gotten Cobia already in one trip. We got, um, well, the snapper and all that, that we went out the next time deeper and we got I mean, big ass amberjack, like pretty much every drop. I got a huge, like four and a half foot, 20 plus pound barracuda. We got, um, Big snapper, the amberjack. Oh, we got cobia. Uh, so they're out there, man. We're we're definitely gonna smash on them. They love the jigs, dude. They've been crushing the submission jigs for sure. It's been cool. What's going on, man? Not much. Hey, we're on uh, YouTube. If you want to join us, Instagram crew is doing the uh, YouTube thing. If you want to come hang out with us over here, Graham says weather's been cold here. Went out to Dana Point last weekend, 39 degrees at launch. Yeah, bite was good. 10 butts during slide tide. That's pretty good. 18 to 21 range. Yeah, just, just on that legal mark. Did you do, um, were you guys close to the surf there? Like right there by that beach that everybody goes to? Or did you like go offshore a little bit more? Gulf of Mexico is horrible, super shallow. Bro. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen the Gulf. It's even worse too like to get to the shelf. <laughs> it's crazy. It's nuts. I feel like South has got us. So we're not too bad. 
it, but we're in Jacksonville. And if we just go a little bit South, like an hour South, like if we can launch the boat in St. Augustine, the shelf is actually like, it's like 10, 15 miles closer. So that might be the way to go. Bring the boat down there, launch it, and then and then head out to the shelf. It's pretty good. Sorry, Yakuda. Nice catch. But thanks, man. Yeah, that, that thing was fighting like crazy. We weren't sure what we had. First, we thought it was like a Wahoo when we saw it at the boat. Everybody was all pumped. But we took the Barracuda. That thing was great, man. It tasted really good, too. It was um, legit underrated. St it. You guys, this thing smelled like trash. Like it smelled just as bad as the Pacific Barracuda, but I think it was worse. Like I don't know what it is. People call them like the slime sticks, but their their slime is just smells so so nasty. But it was one of the best tasting fish we've had out here. I think flounder. What have we eaten so far? Redfish, um, the speckled trout. We had flounder. We've eaten the barracuda. The barracuda was up there. I think flounder was probably the best, and then barracuda was probably second on the list. What is your best color? OC Ranger 175 asks, what's the best color slow pitch jig in your opinion to use for colder waters versus warmer waters? Um, you know, I haven't really seen a correlation with the colors, to be honest with you. Um, as we've been throwing everything and it's all kind of been working, I think what's more important than anything is um like how you work the jig as opposed to the act the actual color and i've talked to these guys and i know these guys have um know this stuff pretty well but i'm not like a huge color guy to be honest with you i'm definitely more of a um more of an action person either changing the jig profile so it falls differently or changing the action in which you retrieve or like pop it and work it i think that's to me a lot better i think one of the bigger things is glow does it have glow or not glow but um, it really didn't seem to matter w which color we were throwing because I just throw kind of what's ever in stock <laughs> or whatever I have. I honestly don't even measure color that much. Uh, I think the sunset that where the whole jig glows or jigs that have glow on it, it's not. I think that's a little more important. Um, you know, I think glow helps in a little more murkier waters or like during sundown and sunset. But like when it's clear and stuff like that, I feel like almost having the golden death color like behind me um, or like the live bait tend to do a little better, maybe in some of the clearer water and stuff like that. But so I don't have too much of a, of an opinion on that. I know some guys are like, I think color is everything. And there, there may be something to that. I definitely don't disagree with them, but I'm, I'm not too much. I'm, I'm not really a color guy all that much. I don't get too hung up on what it is, you know, be, beside the basics, maybe, you know, light colors on light days, dark colors on dark days, stuff like that. More working, more of the shades and all that stuff. Hopefully that um, worked out for you. All right, guys, I'm going to sign off of Instagram because I need my notes too on my phone. And uh, if you want to find us on YouTube, YouTube Submission Fishing. See you guys there. Let's see here. Dave Rage, who's listening on my drive home? Right on, Dave. Yeah, and you guys don't know, all we upload all these things onto Spotify too. So we started a Spotify channel. So if you guys miss them on YouTube and you want to check them out, definitely. Graham said you were catching the halibut at Doheny Beach. Nice. Chris said Gulf and Atlantic Cuda have high chance of Cigaterra. Yeah, we were... Um, we we're definitely looking into that. We caught a big one too. And they were like, oh yeah, you shouldn't need it. And for those of you guys that don't know, Cigaterra is like a um kind of like a bacteria that some of the fish get out here, uh, especially the large ones, because they eat um the reef, the stuff that's on the reef, the shellfish. And generally it's like the warmer water. Um it's like this pretty nasty bacteria that, that some of the fish have, but the cigaterra thing is interesting because it's like you like you said the cuda have this now what's interesting is my daughter 60 month old she um likes to eat a lot of fish but yeah i didn't give her any barracuda this time because of the risk of the cigaterra i was like yeah if we get all sick that's fine but uh, we smoked some of it we fried some of it it was okay we cooked it up to temperature and it was okay but i know like the the barracuda thing but really when you look at it everything has cigaterra the snapper carry cigaterra the cobia 
uh, mangrove stem, everything that people eat has a cigatera, but they always like, a lot of people like to like zone in on, on one species, like the Cuda, for example, but they're all on the warning system. They're, they're all up there on the thing, but yeah, I wasn't too worried about it. I feel like down South, it's probably a bigger issue. Um, cause we don't really have coral reef up here. It's mostly, um, when we talk about reefs, we're talking about wrecks, uh, decommissioned ships that they sink and stuff. So it's not like too, I'm not as worried as I would be if I was down in, um, eating a lot of that reef stuff. They're eating different stuff here. Not to say they can't migrate and stuff like that, but yeah, you're not wrong. It is definitely something to put on your radar. I definitely wouldn't be eating the barracuda sashimi, which is pretty delicious. Q react said it's a 30 to 40 mile trip to catch a good red snapper, which is not that bad, but 40 mile trip in a jet ski hits different. Now that I'm 35. Yeah. I mean, I haven't really, it's, well, I guess I went on a jet ski a couple years ago. My dad had one, but not, not on the ocean. I've never actually been in the jet ski on the ocean, only like a river, but yeah, you're not, you're not lying. I said, I heard the Atlantic Cuda tastes horrible compared to the Pacific Cuda. I don't know, dude, this great bear, this Barracuda we caught was legit. So I don't know if that's like, you know, it's funny you say that because when I was in California, everybody told me how trash the Barracuda was and that old oh, Barracuda is garbage. Nobody eats it. It was a junk fish. Um, but there were certain people that would tell me, oh, no, Barracuda is actually really good and you should try it and you should eat it. I don't know. This Barracuda was good. The Atlantic Barracuda that we had, I think it was the Great Barracuda. Dude, it was the bomb. I, I'm not going to lie. It was like it was really, really good. So I'm going to try it, try it for myself. I regret not eating the California one because I've caught an illegal or two there and I always released them. And I think Cal on here, Cave Dog, he was like, tell me the Barracuda was really good. So I don't know. I should have done it. Oh, well, next time I go out there, maybe PCS, I'll catch one. We'll see what happens. All right, guys, going on to kind of our uh, main topic, I'll just hit on real quick and kind of go over there's a um, so there's an interesting story um, that's been going about, and there was so I guess I'll kind of set the stage. There's a lot to it. There's been a fishing company or a group of fishing companies that fish commercially. There's um, and this is the Relentless uh, Incorporated versus the um, Department of Commerce is a case that's actually been heard by the Supreme Court on Wednesday. So they're starting hearing, um, and I think the Relentless. And another fishing boat are also suing basically the federal government. And what they do is they're herring fishermen, they're commercial fishermen. So at the crux of it is that basically the NOAA or, you know, the federal fishery is saying that you have to, by law, that you have to have somebody on your boat um, that stays, that measures fish and basically it's for the, like the health of the fishery, right? They want fish measure. They want to make sure you're taking the right fish. Uh, they want to check nets, uh, bycatch and stuff like that. But the problem is, is that the federal agency is saying that these fishermen have to pay the salaries for the federal workers and they have to give um, these people board and rooms and stuff on their boats. So they're saying, yes, okay, so these people work for the federal government, they work for the fishery, and we're checking your fish. Oh, but by the way, there are employees, but we're not going to pay them. The fishermen have to pay them. And in some of these cases, it's up to like uh, 20% of the revenue that it would cost these fishermen um, to basically pay these people to regulate them. So they're basically paying the federal employees to regulate themselves out of their own pockets. Um, which is kind of crazy. Jared, what's going on, man? Welcome to the show. Um, so the, so it's gone to the Supreme court. Now what the, the biggest thing is, and why, why my headline is, are, is a fishing company going to take down the federal government? Because here's the big thing. The, what's being challenged at the Supreme court is called the Chevron doctrine or the Chevron difference. Um, or deference, I guess is what you would call it. And basically what that means is that in like 1984, I guess the EPA, Reagan tried to pass something with the EPA where um, he was like trying to get rid of some laws and the court said, no, 
Um, you can't do that. We're going to have fe federal regulators basically put in laws. So what this means is when these people went to go to court, right? Relentless Incorporated said, look, we don't want to pay the bill. Why, why is we as anglers, why do we have to foot the bill for uh, government employees to come? Well, the Chevron doctrine says basically that um, the court can defer it's ruling. So if it's not stated, so like in the, in the document, it doesn't say, it says that you have to have one of these people on your boat, but it doesn't say who has to pay it. Since it doesn't say who has to pay it, the court is, well, that's why it's called the Chevron deference. They defer the ruling to basically federal agencies. So, uh, department of defense, uh, NOAA, the fishery, all these, all these federal programs. Um, and this affects everything. So it's not just fishing. They, defer the ruling. So the courts just say, look, we're not going to rule on this. It's up to this federal agency, um, that controls like the fishery and stuff like that. They get to decide, um, basically what the rules are. And so what's crazy is it's actually gone to the Supreme court. Um, cause they're saying, well, this is outrageous because the ruling is supposed to say within reasonable rights. Like if it, if it's not stated or if it's, it, it's ambiguous, we defer to the federal agency. Um, so the aid official federal agency NOAA says like, oh, well, the, you you have to pay these guys a salary, even though they're on your boat. And what's crazy is now that it's going to the federal court and there was hearings Wednesday. Um, everybody's kind of, well, depend on what side of political are you on? Some people are panicking. Some people are cheering because now the Chevron doctrine is actually on the chopping block to being cut down. Um, if this ruling stands, so it's crazy that a fishery. Because the Chevron doctrine, I guess, has been something that, uh, depending on which side of political aisle you're on, is something that have been people have been trying to get rid of one way or the other, or some people want it. You know, the argument for the Chevron doctrine is that the courts are not experts in the said field. So that's why it's called the Chevron deference, is that the court says we can't rule on everything and um, the Congress can't make a law on everything. So if it's ambiguous or it's not stated that the federal agencies get to make the rules. Um, so they get to say this and that, cause they're, they're kind of saying, look, we're not experts. So we're going to defer it to these agencies. Now, the other argument on the other side is that it gives too much power to federal agencies. So when these federal agencies come from basically the executive branch, uh, they come from the presidential, uh, branch of government. So the argument there is that, look, the govern the executive branch is not supposed to be making laws. Um, you know, you have the judicial branch, the executive branch and the legislative branch, Congress, the legislative branch are the ones that are supposed to be writing laws, pending laws, going through the house and then having a voted on through the Senate and then put into laws. The executive branch, the, the presidential branch is not supposed to be making laws and setting laws. But what's happening is, is that the, with the deference, it's letting federal agencies, tons of federal agents. I mean, this affects everything like OSHA, Department of Defense, like all kinds of, all these federal agencies are able to make laws or rules. It's kind of what they call them. And they could find people and stuff like that based on deferences from the court. Um, so it's kind of crazy that it's going up uh, to the Supreme Court now because the Supreme Court, um, if you guys don't follow politically is, it's definitely, it's, it's more conservative. You know, they need five votes. Um, so it's funny because every, so everybody's kind of worried on the left and everybody on the right is like cheering it, but, uh, they've had hearings and they started hearing Wednesday. So it's hearing fishermen are going to be kind of the discerning factor. You know, it's like, it's just kind of crazy. I don't know if NOAA just flew too close to the sun by charging. I mean, I think that's crazy. Like putting federal employees on a boat and then you charging people for it. Like, come on. That's, I thought that's what the tax dollars were for. It's just kind of crazy. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the argument. That's kind of what's going on. Um, and that's just the jux or the crux of it. So pay attention guys. I thought it was certainly interesting. Um, it's not a story that's been talked about. Uh, it does affect the fishery and what the, um, the biggest ripple effect with all this is if, um, uh, the Chevron, the Chevron doctrine from 1984 gets shot down. I mean, basically, basically every federal agency is going to lose 
a, a ton of teeth and a ton of power and a, a ton of uh, ability to enforce things without having to go through um, like courts and Congress. So the difference is basically the the herring fishermen went to the court and they said, we want you to, we, the, the um, NOA is charging us and they're making us fund all these people. So they went to the court and the court was just like, well, we're not going to deal with it. Look at the Chevron doctrine. It's up to this federal agency to, to decide. So um, basically this is just saying that they want to go to courts or, and, or have Congress um, vote on things and, and have a past instead of having um, basically an unelected federal agency make the rules. Cause apparently what, I've been looking into it like back and forth. What's interesting is that one of the arguments against it is every four years or every eight years, every time you get a new administration, the rules change. There is no kind of right or wrong since it's a federal agency that's making the changes. It's like, there is no, nothing is set in stone. And I think what they're looking for is a ruling saying, look, we don't have so because what happens is let's say trump gets elected and he goes okay well you guys don't have to pay this because his administration's in well then trump's out and biden's in and now all of a sudden okay well now you have to pay for these people to get in and it's like no matter who they're putting in the rules always change based on whatever whoever the president of the united states is because they're running under the, you know federal jurisdiction um and it's just crazy so basically what gets rid of this is that they're going to make force courts to make the decision and courts did not want to make the decision because they didn't think that they were professionals or that they thought it was better to have, in my opinion, what they wanted was to have professionals and stuff making the call on things that they obviously didn't understand, or they said that they're judges, they're not experts in everything. And I agree with that and why it was formed, but obviously you know that that's not the case. You don't get they're, they don't bring in professionals. They don't bring it. You only get one side of the story. It's like anything, especially in the fishing world with MPAs and stuff like that. You're told that you're getting, uh, they're going to reach out to everybody and get professional opinions, but that that's never how it turns out. You get one side uh, that decides what it's going to be. And then they basically have all the power to do everything. So it's actually, it's a, it's going to be a really landmark decision that affects, affects a whole lot of stuff and not, not just the fishing industry. I mean, all kinds of regulation. If it goes through, um, we don't know. We're just, um, you're just going through, you know, the initial stuff on Wednesday was the first, um, hearing about it and the opening arguments and stuff. But, um, I just, it, the fact that it's gotten to the Supreme court and it, it could be struck down is, is kind of big. So just keep your eyes on that. And it's just kind of funny that it took, there's been companies trying to obviously get rid of this sort of stuff for a long time, but it's going to be herring boats that, ultimately have brought it back to the Supreme Court 40 years later. Yeah, I mean, 1984 or so, about 40 years. Here we are, 2024. It's going to be heard again. Brian likes to fish. What's going on? Yeah, I'll be at PCS, man. I'll have a booth there, definitely. So come hang out. Uh, fake name says, that is interesting, sort of like ATF. Uh, making up rules as they go. Uh, yeah, well, Josh, that's like one of the, obviously, that is one of the big things. So what's funny is when you look at this ruling, you'll see a lot of like pro um, Second Amendment people are all for this because for that very reason, ATF, like the ATF, like taxing guns 200% uh, in certain places just because they feel like that's something they should do because they don't really have to, there's no laws that they really have to follow. It's it's interesting. Sammy says slippery slope. I was making the law on those who enforce them no longer in sync. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. I think what they're what they're trying to do is just get get an answer one way or the other. Because what's gonna if if this we we obviously don't know, but I think theoretically, if this gets shot down, what you would have to have, basically they're just going back to courts making the decisions. So Courts are deferring the decisions now um, to whatever the whatever federal agency, in this case, it's the NOAA, manages the fishery. Um, or like fake name said, you know, the ATF is regulating firearms and stuff like that. And it's only on things that are uh, ambiguous or unclear. So if it's not, but like if it's not in there or written, the courts just say, okay, this federal agency, agency gets to decide. So if they get rid of this, basically 
there's probably gonna be a lot more lawsuits i would imagine because people are going to file tons of lawsuits about all these things that are done illegally but then you at least have a court ruling saying yay or nay because everybody's right everybody's not going to win everything everybody's not going to lose everything there's going to be i think more of a line divided down the road just saying okay can they do this yes they can okay well now it's law or can they not do this okay now it's law they can't do this no matter who gets put in because right now it's like i was saying it doesn't it's all administrative depends on what side of the aisle you're on you know if your guys in it's always great (laughs) and if they're not it's always terrible so just interesting it's definitely interesting to look at i think both ways but yeah i i agree with you it's not going to be definitely won't be cut and dry for sure yeah i think that's the argument is like there's the argument against is for sure like you're saying they're not gonna be in sync and that's the argument is like they're like oh well they're not nobody's mobile or we can we got to adjust quickly and stuff like that so i get it but here we are a landmark decision so yeah i think that'll be it'll be crazy and i'm wondering what impact that has like going forward because you got to think how many things um how many laws get sent down pipelines i don't know if this has anything to do with mpas like in california the marine protected areas um i don't know if those are state or federal but like all those i'm pretty i, I was positive they're uh, california state things but like all of the fishery outside usually like a couple miles is regulated by federal fishery so even though you look at like the california handbook for like rockfish and stuff like that most of those rockfish laws are federal laws um they're not state laws so it's crazy how much it actually encompasses and stuff like that and it's weird because they're not even technically laws they call them rules but then the rules still have to be enforced and you can be fined if you don't follow the rules. So that's how they get around, like calling them laws and stuff like that. It's, I don't know. You'd have to, you can go watch a lot. I was watching a lot of stuff on YouTube, but a lot of lawyers are really getting into it. Crazy. Forcing a, forcing a boat to pay someone else. If a boat doesn't have an extra space, then what? Minus one crew, extra food. Yeah, it was, it was costing about 20% of revenue. I, I agree with you on that. Like, because the rule says that they have to have somebody on board measuring the fish and stuff. Well, it's like, okay, you, they passed the law. That's fine. But since the law didn't say who had to pay, uh, the fishery was like, oh, well, the boats have to pay. And the court sided with the boat or the, co- the courts sided with um, the federal agency. That's why it's gone to the Supreme Court because it was an appeal and everything like that. But, but the, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, that's the the corruption part of it, right? Like, I don't know any person that would think that that's the right thing to do. Put them on the boat. Okay, well, then pay them. The government can pay them. I don't know why that was. I don't think that that's controversy at all. But the fact that they had the the authority to charge the boats to regulate themselves, that's kind of crazy. Crazy, crazy. So, yeah, we'll follow that as we go. We'll see what happens. And maybe nothing happens. Maybe Supreme Court could be like, nope, Chevron doctrine stays and nothing changes. Have a crew member trained and licensed, maybe sort of crazy. Yeah, I don't know. I think they want the outside. I don't think they trust crew members, you know what I mean, to like regulate themselves. It's like the herring fishery. I don't know too much about it. I think they're out of New Jersey and Rhode Island and stuff like that. So I, I'm not too familiar with the fishery, to be honest with you. I can't really speak on that too much, but yeah. It's just crazy that fishermen could be the one <laughs> bringing it all down. It's wild. It's going to be wild either way. There's going to be heated debate. Cool, crazy stuff. Yeah, that's all I had on that. you guys have any insight let me know and we'll we'll follow it as we go let's see here moving along moving along we had some more um check out some instagram questions had a couple from you guys we have one here big papa what's going on man i saw you in the uh, instagram chat earlier wanted to say what's what jigs for benito um usually the 40 gram 
40 gram assassin, uh, sumo works too, but usually the assassin's my go-to, uh, 40 gram, 60 gram. If you're going, uh, a little later in the summer and the bidding door pretty big, you could probably even get away with the 20 gram to be honest with you. I've caught them on that, but 40 gram assassins usually like the, my sweet spot. It's the flatter, slower jig, but if they're in the area, just cast it out. Um, and just do like a steady retrieve with some pops in between. And yeah, man, they'll be all over it. 60 gram too gets bit. Even the 20, we usually can't get it as far. But if I, if I was going to get one, I'd, I'd go with the 40. 40 gram smashes them. We've been getting them out here. It was crazy. We found a Bonito. And we found the Bonito that were just like the ones on the West Coast. And then we caught another one last time we were out. And I think it was the false albacore. So it wasn't really the same. But it was crazy. We were coming back last week and freaking Benito, dude, were straight up boiling like um, like tuna. Like the birds were underneath and they were popping out of the water. Like they were going crazy. It was pretty cool. Cold too. Cold water. But I caught them last year in the winter in um, in San Diego. So interestingly enough, yeah, I've had some decent Benito fishing in the colder water. So yeah. 40 gram, if that answers your question. El Sueño says, what's going to be your biggest fish this year? El Sueño, I have no idea. If I can go, maybe a grouper. I do have a, there is a chance. I mean, you can't keep them or anything, but there's, they got the Goliath grouper out here. They've got um, the big Amberjack, Cobia get big, Bull Reds. Um... Even the great barracuda get massive. I mean, 80 pound amberjacks. There's big tile fish. There's a lot of big fish in Florida. I don't think there's as big as far as like bluefin, you know, on the West Coast. Probably not a bluefin unless I go out there. I'll probably get it. I don't know. I'll probably get a bluefin trip in. It'd probably be a bluefin again if we do go back to the West Coast fishing. East Coast, probably, probably 80 pounder. We'll say we'll say eighty pounds. I really don't know. Uh, OC Ranger says new colors for the ogre. We do have new colors for the um, two hundred three hundred gram. We brought out the um, macro color. Let's see what I got here. Got this one, which is like the squid pattern. It's got the pink and the glow dots and the black head. We've got um, one that's patterned like a mackerel and then one that's got mint and gold on one side. And the mint side's all glow. So half of it glows and the other half doesn't. And that one looks really cool when it falls. Those are in the two and 300. Uh, so we do have three new ogre colors available. Those are kind of like the lighter tuna rockfish. Um, and probably out here in Florida, they're going to smash as well. Yeah, we definitely had some. Brian says, oh, tired of the government regulations. Can't even register a new dirt bike in California anymore. <laughs> yeah, man. I feel in you. I feel in, I feel in that pain. The um, You know what's crazy too? Like out here in Florida, because we've been getting, having to get like my boat and like trailers and all that stuff registered. Like you what is it like you if trailers are under so both my trailers are under 2000 pounds i bought a trailer for like kayaks and then one for my boat so when the trailer's under 200 pounds you need a title but they don't have to be registered or something like that so like you get a title for it that you own it yeah but it doesn't it doesn't have to be registered every year so like you don't have to pay registration um and stuff like that like you, like you do in florida or in california right you got to pay like your trailer registration every year so under certain weight here they don't even make you register the trailer they're like well here's your plates and here's a title for it but it doesn't have to be registered yearly i'm like hell yeah florida that's what i'm talking about <laughs> macro colors bomb yeah dude that macro color slays especially the uh, like the 80 gram yeah we've been smashing on that thing mark what's going on man glad you could join us going to pcs yeah i'll be there uh, we're gonna have a booth and real-time fishing oos what's going on man we're gearing up um we said got my flight book today or yesterday and got my hotel all booked up uh, we've got our space ready um 
Yeah, we're good to go. We're kind of figuring out logistics. Uh, like I know last year we had like um, Tackle Express and some other places like carry jigs, and then we just sent them that way. Uh, I don't know if we're going to do that or if we're going to have inventory. So we'll figure it out, but we'll be there for sure. I'm trying to get some, I don't want to promise anything or, but we're trying to get like some, <clears throat> like some custom jigs made, so kind of some one-off like exclusive deals that we've never manufactured before. That's kind of in the works. If they can get done in time, um, should be pretty exciting. If we get closer and they're there, we'll definitely reveal them. Uh, something we have never seen before, uh, some new jigs. So if we can get that going, uh, I'd like to have some of those on sale for PCS too. But if anything, well, I'll just be there uh, demoing products and then sending people out uh, to buy them at the different booths. And if not, I'll bring product and sell it myself. Corey King, what's going on, man? Glad you could join us. OC Ranger, what's going on? Same grouping. Yeah, Sammy. Same thing. Uh, fishing reps group. So it'll be kicker, war baits, um, myself, and I think baits reels. I don't think it was going to go. I know fishing reps has some more people in there, but I know us three for sure will be in that kind of the same area. I think the same zone too. I think the same place we were last year, like that same strip. I don't know if I'll be like on the corner, but I'll, I'll be, I think we got that same, same area, uh, which was pretty cool. Real time fishing. Do you have any charter recommendations in Florida? Um, I don't really, who's that one guy we went with Jessica. Who's that one kid that took us out fishing here in St. Augustine. I don't know. <laughs> I'd have to look. I, I don't know anybody at the top of my head. Salty dog fishing or something. Yeah. But uh, real time. Yeah. Like it's different because. Like in Florida, it, it's not the same. They don't have the party boats. Like in California, I can name a hundred like the Grande, the Malahini, right? The Thunderbird. It's just like there's endless. The San Diego, the Pacific Queen. There's just like dozens and dozens of boats you can get on but out here it's like they don't have the big charter boats they have uh, private charters which are usually private boats that only hold between like two and four people maybe six people six pack boats um like you find them on fish booker and then you just meet them at the dock and they take you out so it's a little different definitely a different vibe i i don't think party boats are like a thing out here like they are in uh, san diego Mark wants a hot pink sumo to match his kayak. We'll get the sunset. The sunset sumo has, it's got hot pink on it. It's like hot pink and yellow. That'd be perfect, man. It'll blend right in. Brian, heck yeah, PCS will be awesome. You going to do a day with me, Brian? Like you did last time? That'd be awesome. Alamitos building. Yeah, that's where we were. Brian said, have you started the jujitsu studio yet? No, we haven't. You know, we've been doing the jujitsu studio has been, um, it's been a lot of work because we're, we've been working like with corporate alliances, like a, it's a nationwide, actually it's a worldwide organization. Uh, that's where I got my black belt from. Now uh, I've talked to actually like the founder Fab Fabio Grizel and some of the other people. So we're trying to do like a big gym here in Florida and we've been having uh, we've been looking at locations, but we've been having like um, a big like survey done and uh, geo, what's the word I'm looking for? And all the geo political data as far as like locations and populations. And then we got to look at building costs. There's like, it's, it's a, it's a whole thing. It's not just like a little podunk gym that we've been putting together. So it's been a lot of work figuring out if it's, if it's the right fit, um, for like a big flagship studio and stuff like that. So I guess that's the word I'm looking for the flagship. We're not going to do um, like a little 800 square foot place. We're talking like four or 5,000 square foot flagship. That's got pretty much everything, cleaning crews, professional gyms, management. Yeah. The whole deal. So it's, it's, it's a long, longer process. It's been a long process, but it's going, it's definitely getting there. Are gators an issue fishing from shore there? <laughs> no, I haven't seen any alligators. There, where we are in the St. John's River, um, so 
it's my understanding alligators like fresh water more than they like salt water. Um, and where I'm at in the river, St. John's River, it's a lot more salty because I'm at the part of the mouth, like the intercoastal where it goes out into the Atlantic Ocean where the water mixes. So gators aren't, there's not really gators here. I guess you can see them sometimes in the river. Apparently they live in the ponds and stuff and the lakes because they like the fresh water. Um, I honestly haven't seen one yet. They're crocodiles. Now there are saltwater crocodiles, but apparently they don't come this far, this far north. They stay in like South Florida. So they are here. People see them like they're around, but mostly um, fresh water. Apparently there's some in the river. Some people say, but they're pretty docile. They don't, I guess they don't give a mess with people. And if they get over four feet, people go hunt them and kill them and stuff like that. So it's mostly the smaller ones that just kind of stay out of the way. I know everybody talks about the gators, but I haven't really seen them out here. <laughs> Crazy. Dave Ray said he took a party boat out of Cape Canaveral area and also did a center console, the Isla Morada in the Keys called Real Attack. Oh, nice. Yeah, I went on a charter boat in um, Virginia some years ago. but I mean, that was a little far north, a little bit different. So who knows? All right, guys. Any peacock bass in the canals? Yeah, there is. I don't do too many, um, too much freshwater fishing, but yeah, apparently the peacock bass are a thing. The bass fishing out here is apparently fire uh, in the freshwater. There's like just as much freshwater fishing as there is saltwater fishing. <laughs> like here on the St. John's River where I live, like if you go south on the river, like it turns into freshwater and then basically there's like bass and freshwater fish. And as you come north where I am, it's saltwater and it's like redfish and black drum and sea trout and all that stuff. It's crazy how it's like the same river turns into two totally different fisheries. No, man. Um, not sea lions. We don't have sea lions out here, but sharks. Sharks have been like absolutely insane. We go offshore fishing. So we went out last, um, we went out last week and we probably lost we probably lost close to 20 fish to sharks and we were catching fish on every drop like fighting fish too like big amber jacks uh kevin got like a 40 pound amber jack just bitten in half uh at the boat uh it's crazy we we, we were just getting sharked left and right they'd come up they were like eating them on the side of the boat or you'd be reeling it up and you get like halfway up and you know you get sharked because all of a sudden like it's already a hard fight they just they take off with it, it it's crazy the sharks are a big problem i think worse problem than the sea lions for sure. I mean, they don't harass you like the sea lions, you know, but yeah, when you're trying to catch fish, it's crazy, man. The sharks are no joke. Well, see, Ranger said, moving back to Georgia in a year or so, do you have any recommendation for Georgia coast? Have you fished any of the inlets rivers? Um, I haven't, but where I'm at in Jacksonville is we're pretty close to Georgia. We're like, we're just south of Georgia. So I imagine they've got to be um, pretty similar. I know so I don't, I'm not too familiar with it, but depending where you are in Georgia, I'm not too familiar with it though. But like inshore here is like, it's insane. Like Jacksonville's insane. What's, what's nuts is that like people were like in Florida, they, they kind of like poo-poo the Jacksonville area, like as far as fishing goes. But I, I think it's like, I think people have been lying about it and acting like, oh yeah, I don't fish there. It's not that good. It's, it's it's insane. Every time we've gone out, it's like last time we went out, we were hitting wrecks on my boat and it was like, like big ass, like you guys get like those big yellow tails. Like you go to the islands and you're like, Oh, you catch a few yellow tail. Maybe all day the boat gets a couple. This was like every drop we were getting big ass fish, 20 pounders, 30 plus. And it's the middle of winter. And it was like, it was crazy. And then you go to the river or just go into the offshore here in my backyard is like mangrove snapper and bull reds and stuff. There's tarpon 10 minute paddle from my house, you know, around the Island, 50 pound tarpon jumping out of the water. Uh, you know, and then you go up into the intercoastal zone, redfish everywhere, sea trout, like it's nuts, dude. And every time we go out, it's just like, there's fish and fish and fish everywhere. We went to the pier today and it was like freezing ass cold. And we were just every single drop we were getting, I mean, they were just crappy little blue fish, but it was like every drop on the jig surf fishing's got pompano and i mean there's 
king mackerel in the surf. It's just, it's nuts, man. It, it's insane. I think you'd be fine in Georgia. I think it's similar, similar fishing. Quarter king bull shark. I don't know. They look like lemon sharks. I don't know if that's what they were though, as they were like really yellow and tan. But um, yeah, I've got a reel that I was going to post. I've got it all made up, but yeah, they were just chomping on fish, man, biting them in half, pulling up half. And that's good though. When that happened, because I'd rather pull up half the fish because then at least you get your jig, but sometimes they, they eat the whole damn thing and they swallow the jig and then it just breaks off. You can't fight them. You can't get it back. They turn and burn and that's it. We lost so much gear. It was like, it was crazy. <laughs> Super disappointing. But we heavied up. We got some more. We got the arsenal back here. Been rigging up the big boys, the heavy rods. We went out. I think we were a little undergun last time, though, too. We were having trouble getting them up fast enough. So, because they fight so well and they were so big. But I think we got them next time. We're going to smoke them. Oh, man. You just, Mark didn't know. He didn't know you were moving to Savannah. <laughs> It's breaking news. OC Ranger moving to Savannah, Georgia later this year. Corey King says, I landed a lemon shark in the Keys and my wife hooked a big shark in 12 pound. It was getting spooled. Yeah. Yeah, we were getting spooled like crazy. So we just locked down the drag and let him break it because it's like we didn't have any way to, to fight him. It sucked. But we'll be ready. All right, guys. Thanks for hanging out. I really appreciate you all. Hopefully you learned something. Yeah, keep your eyes on that case. Uh, see what happens. <clears throat> we'll be back for PCS in March and a uh, spotty wool is going on. So you guys definitely compete in that. I'll be back next week and um, maybe we'll have a guest. Maybe not. We'll, we'll figure something out. I know it's slow in the winter and you know, not much to talk about as far as fish popping off. Fisheries are closed or, you know, fish just aren't around, but we'll be here. We'll talk about something. We'll figure it out. We'll give you guys some fishing entertainment one way or the other. And um, yeah, it'd be good. Love hanging out with you guys and we'll see you next week. Oops.